gang what is going on it's your girl jenna and we have gerard on the other end here still on the virtual end seven footers episode 85 and we have officially closed out the 2019 2020 season and man it was a sweet victory for los angeles lebron james and the lakers won la their 17th title tying the Celtics for the most of all time. This is LeBron James's fourth. He was crowned the finals MVP. And man, did he make some history, Gerard, because he's the first <laughs> player in NBA history to do so with three different teams. I mean... <laughs> so, I mean, let's just talk about this. You are extremely happy because you are a noted LeBron stan. And this... Makes you feel very good, right? You're like, my dude won. All you haters out here talking about washed king and all this stuff. This is this is your time to gloat. You feel good. <laughs> For those of you listening at home, Jenna's holding up uh, the GQ issue that has LeBron on the cover with the with the Olympic crown on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot we were filming for a second. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> But you're 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 feeling good, right? I mean, you're you're there. There's a level of joy that you feel, right, because of this championship that LeBron has won. I do, I do. And tell me, what what is it specifically about this that makes you feel so good? Like, do you feel like people are doubting him? Like, what's the what, what's the deal? Right, right. I just felt like I was on a game show at first. I was like, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> On a real note, though, I mean, yeah, it, the narrative, don't get me wrong, both teams, the narrative would have been great. I love a good narrative, as everybody knows, but I'm happy for a number of reasons. Obviously, I am the most happy for them kind of winning this title dedicated to Kobe after everything that had happened. Like, what timing, mm -hmm. if you really think about it? in a weird universe kind of astrology <laughs> way, whatever y'all at home like to do. But like, what timing? I mean, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way with the loss of Kobe's life. There's never right, a right. time for that. But I mean, for the chips to fall in the hands of the Lakers to land LeBron James and Anthony Davis now in the conversation for the best duo of all time, uh, but I'll pump the brakes for- I was gonna say, are they when the, already? Black what one, one title the best duo of all time <laughs> right right hey you know you know these people out here they get they get wacky in these streets which we'll get to but yeah i mean to to win it in the name of that plus the chips falling in place it really is it's it's part of as 2020 says or as the kids say 2020 it's just like <laughs> i don't know how this shit happens i'm about to look out my window and see people flying out on brooms and stuff you know? so, look like, i, I... <laughs> <laughs> um look it was congratulations to the los angeles lakers their 17th nba title as we said uh genie bus you know um lakers governor um wins her first championship now as the you know as as the woman in charge so kudos to genie look the lakers were just a better ball club right i mean when you have lebron james and anthony davis that's a real hard duo to stop right You've got two of the five best players in the world on one team. And as good as Jimmy Butler is, that ain't enough to take up, take down those two. Not to mention, and I always talk about this, and you know this, Jenna, the stars do what stars do. It's about, can you count on these role players and these other guys to step up and do what they have to do? And I'll be fair, man. A lot of those mid-level guys and uh, KCP and his clutch deal, and we were like, oh, is this guy going to be any good? Like, yo, KCP was so good. He and Alex Caruso, defensively. Listen, Duncan Robinson and Tyler Hero are going to be having nightmares for months about those two, seeing them in their dreams. Because they were, when the Lakers get to it and they decide they're going to play 
high level defense and when they do that's the best defensive team in the league they just they're just too big too strong too physical and you know duncan and tyler and the and the, and the role guys on miami could not overcome that and you know it's no shades and they're young they're gonna they're gonna get better with experience you know but it was lebron anthony and though and his supporting cat and their supporting cast they really elevated their their play when it mattered and that's ultimately what this is about and i want to make sure you know give props to the heat hell of a run um they're such a good team and we'll talk about them a little bit later but you saw what lebron james can do in terms of elevating those around him breathing spirit into and inspiring uh you know his his guys and his teammates and listen those guys they played well and you you have to give them that i mean rondo was great like all everyone really really chipped in and did their part of course lebron and ad were the stars but those guys really played their part i couldn't agree more and it it's incredible to see rondo really if you think about it that's rondo when we when we say these things and you have a tendency to bust me for this too because I get overly excited because you know Rondo's on my list of players that I'm obsessed with playoff but, Rondo I'm like please that dude <laughs> yeah if we really think about it playoff Rondo is not different than regular Rondo in my opinion I mean that's always Rondo to me in yeah a, I mean in a, on a real note yeah he what it is is he's got a high basketball IQ and he is another adult that LeBron can give the ball to and Rondo can get the Lakers into their sets and into where they have to drape. He's another adult decision maker on the floor. And in the finals, at the, at the highest leverage of basketball, right? highest stage, highest leverage games, you need people who can keep their heads cool and they know how to make the right decisions and they can do the simple thing. You know, uh, Stan Van Gundy said this to me once and I, I, I repeated it on the pod before, I'll say it again. People, when they watch great players or even professional athletes, they always marvel at the amazing thing that they do. Stan's point is, that isn't what makes a great player great. It's not the amazing feat they do. It's their ability to do the simple thing over and over and over without making mistakes, right? And again, when you're at the highest leverage, making the least amount of mistakes, that matters. LeBron is a nut LeBron, excuse me. Rondo is another veteran along with LeBron with a high IQ who's not going to make mistakes, right? Or make fewer mistakes than someone else. And that's that matters. When the margins are thin, yeah, the, the final score of game six was a blowout. But when the margins are thin, that's what matters, right? You need someone who can make an entry pass and not throw the ball away, right? Like things like that. And it's it's it may sound simple and routine, but we see it happen all the time where you know, the, the, the pressure of the moment and the situation gets to guys and the simple now looks really complicated. And Rondo's just another guy who can do the simple things and make the right decisions. And it was a great, great, great signing by the Lakers to get him. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. It's a joy to hear what he has to say when they mic him up or in between plays, especially within this series. We obviously saw that a lot being a veteran on that team. Like you said, it's another adult figure for LeBron to pass the ball to and kind of help facilitate on the floor and kind of be a second pair of eyes per se. But yeah, to hear him and see him do his veteran thing, well-deserved. And uh, he was another one that was great. And like you said, all the, the role players stepped up and what really helped the Lakers win this and seal the deal was the fact that they delivered on both ends. The defense was amazing. And like you said before, when they really want to turn it on, mm -hmm. they have the capability of doing mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And going off of another thing that you pointed out with LeBron and his, his just his ability to elevate a team and others around him. That is, I don't think we talk about this enough. That is one of LeBron James's, superpowers in, oh, no doubt. in my opinion and it's his ability to make others great that's that's hard to do you can't sure change is. people and and just make them different and that's what really does separate him and I always always say this on this podcast and if I really had the time I would go back and make a little loop video and laugh about it 
pointlessly, but he took the garbage Cavs to the NBA finals. <laughs> but but like a, a prime example of that of what we're saying is that scenario. Yeah. Those that was not a championship team. Yeah, I don't yeah. even know how it happened. I still question to this day. <laughs> I, I just don't understand. But it's the ability that this man has. He. He, he had a record triple-double in um, in this series and making it, I think he finished with a triple-double in mm-hmm, game six mm-hmm, in the closeout mm-hmm. game. It's it's just insane. And it goes back to what we also talk about as well, that switch that he has. Like, oh, I honestly, I wish I could go out every day and be like, yeah, watch, I'm going I'm to light up this damn journalism floor today. <laughs> I'm going to write everything. I'm like, going to light up this journalism floor. I love it. But, right? Like, I didn't even know what to say. Because like, But for real, it goes back to the switch. He he just, from his, he's an intelligent man. You can, you just know, you can tell on and off the floor. He's an activist. And with those smarts combined with the knowledge that he has, the way he takes care of his body, how he, he kind of has been through everything that he now can share with others. It's just, it's remarkable. I, I could go on forever and ramble, but that's what I'm he, starting. So I have to cut it off. He is obviously physically gifted, but you know, the, the, he is 35, right? I mean, but what I always talk about is the mental game. He is a computer brain and he thinks and reads the game at such a, maybe the highest level we've ever seen in professional basketball. Right. And so when you have all that coupled with his physical gifts, that's a really difficult combination to stop. It's really hard. Right. Can it be done? Of course it can. And it has been. Right. But it is it's challenging. It's not easy to do that. Um, And again, you know, I think what you saw was when the Lakers are on full, full go. It was already going to going to be if the Heat were going to win. Everything would have had to gone right right for them to win in seven and we talk about this all the time with championships yeah talent matters but you need a little bit of luck too and by luck i don't mean you luck your way into a title but you have the breaks have to go your way right the heat none of the breaks went the heat's way right you got yeah. two injuries early. i mean it's just it's just you can't they needed everything and that still might not have been enough for them to beat the lakers but that's what they needed to even get to to a seventh game and you know again kudos to to miami and Jimmy for and, and and you know Tyler had a had some moments. Duncan had a good game uh, last game. You know there are moments, right? But it wasn't enough to overwhelm, you know LeBron, AD, and their supporting cast. So kudos to the Lakers. Amen. Kudos to the Lakers. It was nice. It was a nice thing to see after the events of 2020 and that are still occurring. <laughs> yeah, but. We need to talk about the conversation surrounding LeBron James and his bold statement after he won his fourth finals MVP and fourth title. Because in my opinion, as a fan, taking the journalist part out of it, when he said that, the the Le- known LeBron James fan would think, in my opinion, I didn't expect that from him. He's not usually like like that like I want mine give me mine because he's always more of the you know I'm not chasing whatever I'm not or whatever you know what I mean so very nonchalant I was shocked a little bit you're referring to the quote LeBron said where he said we just want our respect Rob wants his respect and I want my damn my respect too damn it right is is that that that's what you're referring to yeah I feel like that was a little it was a little message I wasn't expecting him to say something like that. I feel like that's more of a bolder LeBron James quote. You know what I mean? Usually yeah. he's very angelic and and dainty with his words. I really thought it was going to come out different. Now, don't get me wrong. I loved it. I stood up. There was a few fist pumps and screaming and other things along that, that nature of behavior. And, yeah, I, I liked it. But I wasn't expecting it. So here's what's interesting. So this is around this idea of are we and we the collective, we giving LeBron his due and enough respect. I will I will say this. I believe that the intelligent members of the basketball media and people who follow the game and analyze it 
um, give him his proper respect as, as, as you know, as he's earned and as is warranted. Um, yeah. You know, this week on True Hoop, shout out to True Hoop, we're doing a goat goat week discussion. Um, and Wednesday, tomorrow, when this when this episode comes out, on um, or or actually Tuesday when this episode comes out, my day for True Hoop will be Wednesday, and I'm going to talk about my top five. I've said it before on this podcast. LeBron is firmly in my top five all time, and he's actually number two on my list of greatest basketball players of all time. And, you know, so I think, again, people, and a lot of people I know think like me. What I think happens is, to your point, Jenna, use a word that you mentioned earlier, narrative. And, and there's this back and forth on social media amongst sectors and groups of fans. And that's where the conversation gets loud and it's unclear well, who's doing what, right? You have a certain segment that's loud and like, oh, LeBron's not this, he's not that, whatever. And it, and it just and it all crystallized for me during Game Six, right after in the aftermath, the reaction I got from two people, one being you, Jenna, and one being our friend Gabby Rosenthal, friend of the show, also my co-host on the Kicks and Shit Show. So following the game. Gabby sends me a text after LeBron's uh, post-game comments. And she says, what, LeBron doesn't even thank his teammates after all that? And I was like, uh, okay. I, mean, I, was like, I was like, I think you're a LeBron hater, but it's fine, whatever. I mean, and she is, she is an admitted LeBron hater. And then my response or my, my interaction from you, which is, oh, y'all better respect King James and stop hating and whatever. And it's just like, this is the dichotomy. You have a stan like you on one end and a hater like Gabby on the other end. Oh and, of course, the reality is it's somewhere in the middle that's more nuanced, okay? You operate under the, uh, under the guise of LeBron's perfect and does no wrong. Gabby operates under the guise of everything he, she finds. She looks for things to nitpick. The crown. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. This, this is what, but this is what I mean, right? She looks for things to nitpick. You're like, you see nothing. Whereas I'm like, okay, let's just be honest about what all of this is. All right? Sounds and, like a typical conversation with the three of us. Uh, 100%, yes. <laughs> extremes. Both of you are extremes. And I'm like, let's just be rational and real about this. And look, uh, again, I just think that it, it, it is this, what do I always say? Comparison is the thief of joy, right? And it's always about comparing. Oh, but he's not better than Kobe or, uh, and all like he's not Jordan it's all these silly reductive arguments that we have and I said it before I'll say it again yo no LeBron is way better at basketball than Kobe Bryant that's no that's no sorry Laker fans whatever I've said it numerous times there are three human beings that have the claim to the greatest player of all time newsflash Kobe Bryant ain't one of them LeBron James sure is Kobe ain't. Facts. I don't care what metric you want to use. And I don't care about your five rings to four. Like that's if you want to reduce it down the rings, that is a reductive argument. Like that's and it's just silly. Then Bill Russell's greatest plays of all time. You got eleven. Like it's just stop. So that that's not that's not an argument. Like again, le- the things that LeBron does on a basketball court are things we haven't seen. And, you know, I- I game five he was getting killed because he passed the ball to Danny Green. It's like, oh, Jordan would have taken that shot. I'm like, yeah, and probably would have missed, right? Like, that was the correct basketball play. Drew in, the de- the defense was collapsed and sunk around him. Danny Green could have sat down, tied his shoe, got back up, and shot the ball before a defender got near him. He was butt naked, wide open. He missed. It happens. But that was the correct basketball play. And that's the... That's the thing that fans need to understand and stop this silly argument of, oh, Jordan would eject. Like, listen, we've seen Jordan pass the ball to Kerr and Paxson in big moments to hit big shots. Because guess what? An NBA player shooting an uncontested open shot, higher percentage of going in than a contested shot. That's just how the game works, people. And so you got to stop these silly arguments. But anyway, I, I just, I believe LeBron gets the proper respect he does. But I think for his stands, like you, you will hear any negative slight and that will make you like enraged and someone like Gabby 
Anytime she hears too much praise, she gets enraged, right? It's it's just this, and, and that's just the sides that people operate on, right? It's like you're either firmly in this camp or you're not. And it's more like, guys, it's nuanced. Like, LeBron is excellent, one of the greatest players of all time. As I said, he's number two on my list. Like, I mean, yeah, that's just what it is. I mean, you are, yes, yes, you are right. But yeah, the conversation with the respect aspect and things like that, it's it's super interesting. I mean, we could dial back into the arguments on every single sports show that there is and all the various all that, points. All that nonsense. Yeah, all the various points that people make or believe that they make, but it is very interesting. And after the post game or in the post game, LeBron also spoke about how the journey of this championship run and this season as a whole from the death of Kobe Bryant on, Mm -hmm. he, he basically explained on NBA TV, how, how things shifted for the Lakers, obviously after the death of Kobe Bryant. And he just basically summed it up and said that the experience in the championship run, especially after that with the goal toward honoring Kobe, hopefully in the end, really brought them closer together. It really, they were already close, but he said, just when we thought we were as close as we can be, we were closer. And they just share this special experience after such a tragedy and having to go through such a tragedy, but it's unique, it's special, they'll never go through it again. And it's it's just crazy to think that all the things that we're going to see from this team after this goes on. Even Magic Johnson got on first take this morning and said, no, Molly, I'm not predicting or whatever. I'm not saying. I'm telling you the Lakers are going to win a back-to-back title. <laughs> Look, it, it's very likely, and we'll get to that. I, I, want, I do want to touch on the Kobe thing really quick. And obviously, Kobe is inextricably linked to the Lakers. That's where he spent his entire career. The Lakers family felt, you know, well, first of all, no one felt the loss more deeply than Vanessa and his daughters. But the Laker family, that's right, the next group in line that that felt this loss on a deep personal level. Kobe is, you know, one of the great players in the history of that franchise. He means so much to the Lakers organization, their fans, and that community. I just want to like, because again, we love narratives and it's just so nice how things wrap up in a pretty bow. They want it for Kobe. That may be true. But Kobe isn't the reason they won the title, right? Like, they were just better than the Heat. Like, period. Point blank, end of discussion, right? The idea of like, oh, but they were undefeated in their Mamba jerseys. Well, they lost game five, so in their Mamba jerseys. Like, it, yes, those things sound nice, and they're cute for stories. And like, when you're doing the Tom Rinaldi ESPN special, and he's like, on a October night in the bubble in Orlando. Like, it, yes, all that sounds wonderful, right? And I'm not negating that, like, they there was an extra sense of wanting to do it but believe me lebron came into this season before the death of kobe being like i'm winning a championship this year right so now yes if that was an inflection point in the season that helped galvanize them even further i'll buy that but you know we need to be careful about how we use kobe bryant as this like avatar for because if they lost what would it have been they didn't want to win for Kobe, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's not, that's, it's just, it, 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 it was a tragic moment. And the NBA family and all of us who cover this league, we're all dealing with it still, right? It doesn't even feel like it's real. Um, but they won because they were better. And I'm happy they were able to win it this year in an important year immediately following his un, he and Gianna's untimely passing. Right, right. I see exactly what you're saying, and I completely agree. Let's definitely not confuse that because back to narratives, it's it narratives are such a great thing and a terrible thing. Yeah, yeah. Because obviously there's an, a large amount of bad narratives. Hence the narrative that could have happened that you um, hypothetically said about if the Lakers had lost, right. there would be trolls who would say such things as right. to link the passing of Kobe to that. And I I won't even get into that because it's ridiculous. But yes, back to narratives. That's why they're bad and what goes on. However, um, yeah. And back to what I said in the beginning as well, the, like I said, it's, it's crazy 
or bizarre, I should say, how the chips fell into place. So, yes, to win the uh, title in such an important year, I think, is a good distinction and way to put it. But, yeah, the when it comes down to a bottom line, the Lakers – outplayed Miami they are a better ball club like you said and when it comes down to it as well LeBron and AD just could not be stopped they turned on the defense along with the rest of the supporting cast and it was over lights out that game six that was such a lackluster game and it's kind of unfortunate to see the heat go out with that type of loss so I, I feel for the Heat with that. I don't know really what went on with them, really. I guess they ran out of gas. It was a lot. It was a hard-fought series. However, looking to the future, I am beyond excited to watch the evolution of M- Miami. And for the first time, it really feels like Dwayne Wade's spirit or the next guy, I should mm-hmm, say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hence, Jimmy Butler yep, is yep. here. And I think it's the start of a beautiful, beautiful journey. I cannot wait to see what goes on in Miami, what pieces they add, who they potentially get rid of, and just really the story and of Jimmy Butler and the evolution of Bam and Tyler Hero. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm super excited. I mean, Spolstra was a phenomenal coach as well. I'm like kind of picking out all these thoughts that I wish I had said prior. But yeah, Spolstra was incredible coaching and also Frank Vogel. I mean, he was never the first pick. People made fun of him. No doubt. Let's call a spade a spade. People thought Jason Kidd was going to take his job. Yeah. He was a laughing stock at one point. And did he really impress, especially with the changing up of the roster and the starters and the rotations in the finals and just kind of the way he coached with their defense? I, it's great to see, especially the coaching match within this matchup in the, the finals. The, the big thing for me about Vogel was he gets a lot of credit for this Lakers team and their defensive disposition all year. That's who this team was all season. They were a grinded out top end defensive team. Vogel gets credit for that. Vogel also gets credit for the ability to get LeBron James to buy into his philosophy and plan. And that is not easy because, again, now... <laughs> Say, you know, to put the critique hat on for LeBron James, he's not an easy player to coach. No superstar is, but he's really not an easy player to coach. Not because he's a bad dude, but because he has his own ideas about how things should be, right? And, you know, to get him to, and that was part of the reason and the friction in Miami when he was there with Eric Spolster, right? It's like he comes in and LeBron expects a certain amount of authority and leeway, and that's not how it works in Miami, right? And so, for, for Vogel to get LeBron to buy in, that made it then easy for everybody else to buy in. And kudos. Vogel gets a ton of credit for that. He did a hell of a job. Look, the Lakers are in prime position. They're going to have to do some things, right? Because a lot of those guys are going to be – their deals are expiring. I believe KCP, I think that was the last year of his deal. That was a two-year. Um, Marquise Morris is up. Alex Caruso, I believe. And they're going to have to figure out – uh, Rondo, Howard, they have to figure out who and what they're going to do with their veteran minimums and their mid-level exceptions, right? Because, again, you know, LeBron and AD, and remember, AD is a free agent this year, right? So all likelihood, I mean, he said it, he doesn't know what he's going to do yet. I mean, it's likely he's coming back to LA, but that's a super max deal. Well, <laughs> between him and LeBron, that is a large part of your salary cap with two players, right? So who can they get to fill those pieces on lesser deals? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Interesting. And also, too, uh, with the AD and LeBron pairing, I loved hearing, especially in the postseason, how AD would drop these little breadcrumbs in interviews and he'd be like, well, you know, LeBron promised me, he promised me, he told me, and blah, blah, blah. And, it, and then you hear about how LeBron sat down, and this is, I'm talking about early Lakers negotiations, like for him going there and the conversations with Jeannie Buss and Magic at the time and Rob Palenka. And he sold them this story and he delivered. That's all I was hearing today. I saw Magic Johnson on first take, him saying too, that LeBron delivered on his promise. And he did. So, it again, it goes back to the power of LeBron James too and just his ability to take a team into flight. 
Well, this, but, is, well, this is also interesting because <laughs> this goes into like the Lakers and like Laker exceptionalism and like, you know, yeah. that, that fan base just thinks that like championships are like owed to them, right? And like they should always be winning titles and, you know, I mean, look, and they and the Celtics have won 17 titles apiece, right? 34 of the league's titles have been won between two ball clubs. That's more than half of the league's titles have been won by two, two franchises. So I get it. So this whole idea of Magic getting on and being like, he delivered on his promise to us. And it's like, all right, dude, calm down. Like, <laughs> like relax. Like, you know, I mean, yes. Like, you, you, you have two of the five best players in the world. That generally means you're a title contender. And if things work right for you, you're probably going to win. And they did. So kudos to the Lakers. Heck yeah, kudos to the Lakers. And going off of that, let's talk a little bit about the post game because that's <laughs> when the fun happens. The goggles are broken out. The mm-hmm. champagne is mm-hmm. flying. So we had some sweet moments. We had some funny moments. And I'm just going to start with going in order, I guess, because the first moment that happened was J.R. Smith was shirtless. I mean, that's just what, that's what, that's, that's what JR does, right? JR shirtless is kind of what he does. And it's like, it, it's a, you know, that's, it, it's, he's, he's sticking with the bit, right? Like that's, that's how that's going to go. He got a bunch of his teammates to also have their shirts off. Kyle Kuzma didn't have a shirt on in the post game. Anthony, uh, Alex Caruso didn't have a shirt on. I mean, it's look, it's Dwight Howard, Dwight Howard. It's listen, it, it, it's, it's for, it's, it's perfect for this internet age and for memes and whatever. So Shouts to JR for keeping that meme alive. Oh, yeah. He was on IG Live pumping everybody up. Dwight Howard was in finals boxers, which I wonder if he purchased those before the game or. <laughs> and they had the trophy on them. So had, had them I custom made. Suspicious. Had them custom made. Right. And, uh, you know, we got to see Caruso's nice shirtless body after which he was the butt of a ton of memes and i say nice shirtless body i'm quoting a twitter user i wasn't staring at caruso in that way (laughs) and kuzma got on live television and said that he was half drunk and he didn't know how to behave so that was fun as well also you know look these players we talked about like is a championship an asterisk or whatnot in many ways i mean it is an asterisk championship but not in the way that you think it's an asterisk championship in the sense that this may have been the hardest championship to win because of being in the bubble and being away from everything and just the, the nature and the unprecedented uh, season that the way it had to conclude. Um, so, right. yeah, I, I again, Miami, all the teams that like advanced to the, to, to the final four, this was a hell of an accomplishment. And particularly, obviously, the Lakers is the chance, but the Miami Heat, I mean, it was – This is grueling, man. This was grueling. It was grueling. What can we... Is Jimmy Butler vindicated after after Um, this? You know, before we go to Jimmy Butler, I do want to say another funny thing happened in the Lakers postgame. The bus apparently left Quinn Cook at the arena. So while... Oh my God, wait. You texted me this. (laughs) While JR was on IG Live... On, on the bus ride back to the hotel. Because that's the thing about the, the, the campus at, at Disney World, the World Wide World of Sports. The arenas and all that stuff are on one side of the, of the theme park. The hotels on the other side. It's not like a two-minute walk. It's like a hike. And so during JR's IG Live, he's on the bus. Like he's wilding, got no shirt on, whatever. Talking to, uh, to Dion Waiters. In the comments, you see Kyle Kuzma. I mean, not Kyle, excuse me, Quinn Cook. Win a championship, I get left at the arena. Like, he's actually seeing what's going on. And then JR goes, yo, we left we left QC at the arena. Yo, we forgot about QC. Of course, they didn't turn the bus around. Matter of fact, Dion Waiters said, yo, man, better get you some Red Bulls and get, get your wings and fly back to the hotel. So, yeah, cold. These dudes are savage, man. These, these dudes are savage. So, who even knows? I'm sure Quinn Cook hitched a ride back with somebody. But, yeah, bus left. Oh, my him. gosh. I'm going to do some more investigating into this because I need to find out exactly how Quinn Cook got home. <laughs> like he probably rode a golf cart or something with the security back to the hotel. Or, or, or a media person or something. Yeah, for sure. No doubt. Oh, my God. Can you imagine like mm-hmm. covering the game and seeing Quinn Cook just like right, walking, stumbling around right. the side? Be like, all right, man, come on. Let me let me give you a ride back. He's like, what happened to your boys? They left me, man. <laughs> Uh, I can't. No, it's funny. But you, you asked about Jimmy. Look, I, I 
Of course, Jimmy Butler. Oh, yeah, Jimmy Butler's vindicated. No, no, that's that's what's perfect spot to go to. Um, look, Jimmy. It was clear that Jimmy, he is a certain type of player, and the way he wants to play is a certain type of way. Jimmy demands to be held accountable. He wants to be held accountable. And he wants to, if he wants that, he wants all his teammates to also be held accountable. And that's why it didn't work in Chicago and Minnesota and Philly, right? Because, again, Jimmy is confrontational and he's not afraid of confrontation. Like, if he sees something that's not going well, he's going to call it out. Maybe often not in a kind way. That's just, that's who he is. That works in Miami because all those guys are accountable. Down, that's the culture that Pat Riley, Andy Ellsberg, and Eric Spolcher have built down there. So Jimmy fits like a hand in a glove, and it's perfect. I'm happy he's found a home. He's shown what he can do on a big stage, right? I mean, he essentially went toe-to-toe with LeBron James, right? Like, that, that that's what he did. And let us not forget, last year, he was a Ka- Kawhi Leonard triple bounce shot away, right, from taking the 76ers and an underperforming Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons to the Eastern Conference Finals. So Jimmy is that dude, right? Like he has shown and proven this is someone you can count on in the playoffs. And again, to what we said earlier, the Heat, they have cap space. They're going to get somebody. Tyler Hero is young. Listen, he had his moments in his playoff runs, but he also showed he was a 20-year-old rookie, right? He had his, ooh, shooting shots off the side of the backboard. Listen, that's okay. His confidence, I don't think, is rattled. He'll come back next year and be better. Bam Adebayo is going to come back and be better. The question is, what do they do about Goran Dragic? He's a free agent. Um, you know, what do they do about Iguodala? What do they get in the mid-level? Right? They, they got to make some moves and, and tweak some things. But listen, I think the future is mighty, mighty bright in Miami. Uh, listen, they're, they're going to be on the short list in the Eastern Conference next year to get back to the finals. Oh, heck Yeah. I couldn't agree more that the future is bright in Miami. And before I ask you sort of what's next for Miami, like we said, they have cap space. They got to figure out what they're doing with this roster a little bit. However, it's obvious that Jimmy Butler is the face of Miami. And it brings you back to ask yourself, okay, you just explained how Jimmy Butler plays. He He's that type of dude. He's He's gritty. He's in your face. He's tough will say so it makes you ask yourself okay why what made jimmy butler's other teammates in minnesota and philadelphia not want to play with him and or vice versa either way i'm not saying anything bad but like what made it such a hard relationship right so with that being said going forward the the heat need to be careful with who they're choosing and what guys they're choosing so with that being said who would be a perfect fit for jimmy and who really would we not ever want to pair this so, guy with? So, you know, going back to your point, right, about Minnesota, even early in Chicago and Philly, Jimmy's issue in Minnesota, we've documented it many times. He felt Carl Anthony Towns and Andrew Wiggins didn't work hard enough and didn't want it bad enough because those, well, you, I've said this before, those were two of the most talented guys, and Wiggins obviously, uh, you, you know, is no longer there, but Cat and Wiggins are two of the more talented players I've ever seen. But Jimmy's like, I'm better than you. Why is that? How is it that you have way more talent than me, yet I'm better than you? Yeah, they don't they don't want to work as hard as he does. So that's a that's not a tenable situation. In Philly, it was okay with I think he was fine with Embiid. Brett Brown didn't want to have to deal with coaching Jimmy. Because again, Jimmy will in Eric Spolcher said Jimmy will stop practice to mother F somebody and and we love it. We embrace that here. Brett Brown obviously didn't want to deal with that. But the Heat culture, that's, again, it's accountability for everyone, not just the players, coaches, trainers, equipment staff. Everybody's held to the same standard. And so when you ask what kind of player would work, it's not so much about Jimmy per se. What player fits Miami Heat culture? Who is going to come down here and know the way we do things here is, we are held accountable. We're going to take our physical fitness. Miami is long known as the, the franchise that takes the conditioning and physical fitness more serious than any other team. 
if you can't handle our conditioning from a physical standpoint, because we practice down here, we don't do this. Yeah, no practice thing. No, 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 no. We practice. Oh, you're not used to that. You're not a heat kind of guy. You don't want to be held accountable, you, right? So if you don't meet those criteria, you, they're not going to look for you anyway. So anybody that can pass that muster who wants to work, yeah, of course they'll rock with Jimmy because they want the same thing. So, or someone who's not a free agent yet, but will be next summer. I mean, my God, like talk about a guy who wants to work and be held accountable. I mean, I think Giannis Antetokounmpo would be a hell of a, a match down there with, with, with Jimmy. Right and Bam and Tyler. I mean, look at the size you got right there. Good lord, woo! I mean, and with I mean that's that's some dogs. That's you know, but you know, that's very early, long ways away. But you know, again, anybody who wants to be held accountable and who wants to work, that they're good. It sounds easy, not that not that simple. But anybody who fits that will work out. Well, you know how they do in Miami. Work hard, play hard, baby. Listen, listen you'll, you'll get your chance to hang out in South Beach and do, and do your thing. But you got to work. Got to come That's to work. Right. And if there's anybody who's going to make sure that happens, it's Jimmy Butler. <laughs> so, this is what's so special about this. And this is a whole other pod in itself. But I will say what is so special about what Jimmy Butler and the Miami Heat just did is that they are so young. We don't even realize the good years that are ahead of us. Right now, we're seeing them kind of do the little trial and error kind of vibe. Okay, we just got here. Everybody wants to count us out, this and that. But nah, everybody's going to be whistling a different tune next season. And this is just the beginning. This is exciting. Well, the, the, the one thing I'll say to you, Jenna, to caution yourself against that is, remember in 2012, that's what we thought about the Oklahoma City Thunder with Kevin Durant, James Harden, Russell Westbrook, right? Like, why you gotta do that? Why no, no, do but 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 the NBA is littered with teams like this. They make a finals run, and we're like, oh, they're young. Don't worry, they'll be back for many more years to come. OKC never went back. Orlando Magic never went back. Like it, the, the NBA is full of teams like that. So now I'm not saying that the Heat culture won't prevail, but they're gonna have to make sure that they keep their talent level high. And look, they can't suffer any major injuries, right? The things that things that can happen that break apart and stop. So this idea that, oh, it's a foregone conclusion, the Heat have this locked up for, no, no, no. <laughs> Listen, they're going to have to keep scaling that mountain, right, and keep getting better. I see what you're saying. That OKC example, as you know, hits anyone very hard. Well, look, it, it's, I mean, it hits me hard. I, I love that team. But, but what gives me faith with Jimmy Butler – and this team and all the comments that I made before is the fact that, like we said, it's the culture. So if you really are creating such a culture that is such a huge reason why you're as successful as you are, anybody that steps into this culture, it's it's kind of like a dress code. That's the Once plan. you step in, you get comfortable, and that's it. That's the you know plan. what I mean? Yep. Heat, heat, so, culture, heat culture prevails. That, that's what they hope down yeah. in Miami. If the culture is as strong as they say it is, like somebody used to say about the process, then <laughs> we will see. That was the ultimate Sixers shade. I hope no none of my Sixers friends are listening here. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying. All right. So let's talk a little bit here about next season because we have the NBA draft coming up November 18th. Mm -hmm. Free agent season, late November, early December. That's still up in the air a little bit. And basically... This is going to be a challenge for a lot of people, including people like ourselves covering this, because all the dates are shifted. Everything is different now. So let's look a little bit ahead here. Early title favorites. Just tell me who you think is going to contend after we left off on the note that we did. So Lakers, obviously, are going to contend in the West, the defending champs. The Denver Nuggets, I mean, let's not forget what they did in, in the postseason. They were incredible. Jokic and Murray, a year older and wiser. And as much as they flamed out, look, the Clippers, they have one more year left in their window, right? So they're going to be that we, at least they hope they will. Um, and there's going to be, you know, let's not forget, there's a team up in the Bay Area that's going to be back and healthy with a, uh, a player by the name of Steph Curry and Clay Thompson and Draymond Green and the number two pick in the NBA draft. I mean, hey, uh, that could be something, right? So who knows? And the Eastern Conference, I mean, look, we saw what Boston did. We saw Miami, obviously, as, as the Eastern Conference champion. 
Uh, the Raptors are going to be right there. Um, you know, the, the, the Milwaukee Bucks, my God, they were the best team regular season-wise. And a certain seven-foot sniper is going to be coming off an Achilles injury in Brooklyn with a mercurial point guard. Uh, who know, I, I mean, you're going to have eight to 10, 11 title contenders early. And then by all-star break or so, it'll start. we'll start seeing, okay, who's legit and who's for real. I will say this. The draft is on the 18th. Um, free agency. What I, I've talked to some people, and what it looks like right now is November 30-ish, around there, they're going to start free agency. And it'll okay. be a chance for everybody to sign. I mean, that's, that's, that's not set in stone, but that's the date I'm hearing float, floating out there. Um, <laughs> and that way it gives you a few weeks to get everybody signed before Christmas because I think the goal is to start next season around Martin Luther King Day, January 18th, somewhere in that range. That's the goal. Listen, things can happen, right? COVID spikes, whatever, no agreement. I mean, but that's right. that's what the NBA hopes because their goal is to play a full 82-game season with some semblance of fans. Not the normal, you know, I'm doing my West Coast road trip and we're going to play the Kings, the, the Warriors. It's not not like that. They're going to do it more where they have teams in clusters of, of the country. And they'll mm-hmm. do like, you know, kind of like round robin situations where a bunch of teams play each other and then they limit and they reduce the amount of travel. Because, right, travel is and being right. exposed is what would cause the virus to spread amongst this population. And then potentially in the playoffs, having a bubble type of system set up again as they did this year. Again, that's all early talks right now. A lot has to go right for that to happen, but that is the NBA's plan because then their hope is full 82 game season, finish the finals in the summer, have a short off season and then start back normal time again in 2021 for a full regular season. I have a lot of issues with that and we'll save that for another pod. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, after this, um, we'll get into a ton of that in episodes coming up, seeing as we'll have more time on our hands to chat about that kind of stuff more in depth. And we'll get to hear more from you and your sources and stuff. But before we wrap it up, we gotta, we gotta give a kudos to the NBA and Adam Silver. I mean, guys, in a, in the midst of a global pandemic, they were able to continue the season and carry out the NBA finals and crown a champion with zero positive COVID tests. That is obviously during this time unheard of, hence other leagues. And it is a huge feat that they have come together and put together. And I'm sorry, but this is a first. So they have conquered the unthinkable. This is history making and kudos really to everybody involved. What Adam Silver and Michelle Roberts, head of the MBPA and everybody involved, their staff and their the employees, the players, to get to get this, the Disney World employees, everybody, to get this done with zero positive tests is incredible. It also shows, guess what? If you test regularly, daily, and you wear masks, no spread of the virus. Funny how that works. Anyway, that's a conversation for a different day. Um, but it, it, it listen, Jenna, we, I, I was very skeptical. You know that I was like, this season ain't gonna last. Like how they're gonna how they're right. gonna keep people out of this, right? Like I, I just didn't see a way, but they were incredible. And Adam, I have to give him props because he sent the thank you letter to all the league employees, and not only that, he informed them they'd be all receiving a thousand dollar bonus and four Fridays off beginning October thirtieth, as well as the week of Thanksgiving um, for their efforts. And you know, we always talk about Adam on this show and we always say we often say he's the best commissioner in sports and we believe that he is and look he's not he's not perfect right like he, Adam makes mistakes and there are things about like the connection with owners and stuff that I don't like but he really is a consensus builder and genuinely operates in good faith when he does things and to take care of the NBA employees for the sacrifices they made because again it wasn't just players down there for a hundred and something days you had NBA employees, like people being away from their families. So, <clears throat> excuse me, kudos, kudos to Adam for this gesture to 
his employees, and what a great job done by all those men and women down there in Orlando. 100%. And these people are heroes in their own right when it comes to business models, when it comes to safety, when it comes to different things. So again, yes, kudos to everybody involved with the NBA bubble and the wobble, which also yep. crowned yep. a champion in its own Seattle Storm. Shout out to Seattle Storm. I mean, Shout out to Brianna Stewart, Sue Bird. I mean, you got to love the women. Jill and Lloyd. yep. Hell of a team. Everybody has been championing them. And it's been such a pleasure this season, this unpredictable season. Unpredictable, unprecedented. And, you know, it's, uh, whew, it, it, it's, we, we, we're here. We, it's, it's October and we've crowned the champion finally. Normally, Jenna, we'd be like, we'd be gearing up. Season's about to start. Gearing up. Right, but it's yeah, it, it it's gonna be an interesting off season. But uh, we're not going anywhere, right? We're still have episodes coming up. We have lots to discuss: the draft, free agency. We'll get into it all. So we won't be weekly as as we don't have games <laughs> every every week now. But we'll be back in a couple of weeks to uh, talk about the draft and some other different things, and we'll let you guys know some exciting things we have coming up in the works. Oh yes, guys, stick with us, Draw. Tell them where they could find us. Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, uh, at Seven Footers Pod on Twitter, at Seven Footers Podcast on Instagram, at JS Hector, at Jenna Lemon Stelly, and we'll see you guys next time. Peace. Peace. Spent a couple years out here with these raps Tryna have a plan that we may come true Plotted some jobs but I ain't hit back I don't wanna trap what some man gon' do Chevy told me come